radio enthusiasts. Welcome to another video about early radio from the Roaring Twenties Antique Radio Museum. If you're enjoying the videos, please take a second and hit the subscribe button. You'll be alerted to new videos as soon as they're posted. In this video, we focus on the early history of radio communication in the military. In any war, timely information is one of the most important keys to winning. The Civil War was fought between 1861 and 1865. Long distance military communication during that time consisted of a courier on horseback, carrier pigeon, or wired telegraphy. Each form of communication had its weaknesses, and this spurred the military to continually search for a better way of sending messages. An explosion aboard a Navy battleship, the USS Maine, while docked in Havana Harbor triggered the Spanish-American War of 1898. Wired telegraphy continued to be a primary source of military communication during the war, as seen in this photo of a United States Signal Corps telegraphy station deep in the jungle. Besides setting up telegraphy stations, the Signal Corps was also involved in cutting the enemy's communication cables, again exposing a major weakness in wired communications. The eventual solution to the problem of wired telegraphy had been invented four years before the war by Guglielmo Marconi. In 1894, Marconi had successfully demonstrated the very first means of radio communication, radio telegraphy. The military quickly realized the importance of Marconi's invention. Marconi brought radio telegraphy to the British Royal Navy in 1897. For the first time it was possible to stay in contact with ships at sea almost anywhere. Shown here is a Royal Navy wireless station in 1901. Two years after bringing wireless to the Royal Navy, the United States Navy hired Marconi to test his invention in America. In 1899, Marconi built a radio station in Highlands, New Jersey. The first Navy message successfully sent by wireless telegraphy was to the steamship Counts. Marconi was a radio operator. Radio telegraphy's dominance lasted for decades, but the beginning of the end of its dominance was foreshadowed on Christmas Eve 1906, when Canadian radio pioneer Reginald Fessenden broadcast Christmas music and read the Bible to ships at sea from the North Atlantic to the Caribbean. At the end of his broadcast, he wished all his listeners a Merry Christmas. It was the first long-distance radio transmission of voice in radio history. The United States entered World War I on April 4, 1917. For most of the war, radio telegraph, telephone, and telegraph would supply most of the communication ability for militaries involved in the war. Telephone and telegraph required wires, and wiring up a war zone was a costly, time-consuming, and dangerous task. It was relatively easy for the enemy to sabotage the communication lines and listen in on Morse code messages sent by telegraph. However, field radio telegraph stations developed by the United States Signal Corps were available for immediate deployment, as the Signal Corps had been developing them for several years, as shown in the photo from 1914. While an improvement, still better ways to communicate were needed. Major General George Squire, Chief Signal Officer of the United States Signal Corps, was assigned to work with private industry on the development of voice radio for the military. A radio laboratory was built at Fort Monmouth in Monmouth County, New Jersey. Major General Squire accomplished his mission and in early 1918 the Signal Corps introduced radio telephones into the European theater. Voice over radio proved to be a major improvement over the old established ways of communicating. Receivers like this BC-14A were issued to Signal Corps radio men embedded in combat units. Radio telegraphy in aircraft was first tested by Lt. Benjamin D. Follis, a pilot for the United States Army in 1911. Flying the Army's only aircraft along the Mexican border, his messages were picked up by U.S. Signal Corps stations on the ground. However, over time, the U.S. fell behind England in advancing air-to-air -air and air-to-ground communications. It's a commonly held fallacy that radio communication and aircraft played an insignificant role in World War I. Nothing could be further from the truth. The British Royal Flying Corps, or RFC, began developing radio telegraphy for aircraft in early 1914, just two years after the RFC was formed. 
At the beginning of World War I, the RFC took over a Marconi station at the Brooklyn Aerodrome in Surrey, which was southwest of London. The project was led by Lieutenant Baron T. James. In 1913, Lieutenant James had installed a radio in a BE-2A aeroplane, and by July 1915, the team he led had developed a practical two-way wireless telegraphy system for military aircraft. Sadly, Lieutenant B.T. James was shot down by anti-aircraft fire on the 13th of that same month, but before he died, he completed the project he led, and in early 1916, the Marconi Company of England began production of two-way radio telegraphy for planes that were based on Lieutenant James' work and used in the war over France. Another RFC project began at Brookland in early 1915, the goal of which was two-way voice communication or wireless telephony between aircraft and between aircraft and ground stations. That project was led by Charles Edward Prince, an engineer who had worked for the Marconi Company since 1907. By summer of 1915, Prince's group had developed air-to-ground wireless telephony. It took until February of 2016 for the group, led by Charles Prince, to develop reliable aeroplane-to-aeroplane -aeroplane wireless telephony. By the end of the war, the RFC had over 600 planes equipped with radio and over 1,000 ground stations manned by 18,000 wireless operators. Two-way voice communication between aircraft and between aircraft and ground stations had proved critical to the defense of England and to victory in World War I. That's it for this video. There will be more to come as we continue to investigate the early history of the world's first mass medium, radio. Thanks for watching.